sleepwalking. When I was a young girl of about 14 years old, I was known as the best babysitter in the neighborhood. I babysat for people all over town. I was high in demand, and being a shrewd business girl, I didn't come cheap. But I was worth every penny. I liked little kids and had fun playing with them, and most had early bedtime so when they went to sleep, I could veg out and watch TV. I was living the dream, I tell ya. But not all the jobs were peaches and cream, and one in particular was quite frightening. The couple I was babysitting for, the Sawyers, were new in town. I had never babysat for them before, but I was recommended by someone they knew. I would be babysitting for their son. He was eight years old. He was a cute little boy named Brandon. His blue eyes were brighter than Paul Newman's. He had fine blonde hair and adorable little dimples when he smiled. I arrived at their house at 7 p.m. His bedtime was 9. The parents were supposed to be home by 11. Seemed easy enough. Brandon was a nice little boy. He had a basket full of Star Wars action figures he played with for the two hours I was there before he had to be put to bed. It was a simple job, but there was one caveat. The Sawyers warned me that Brandon was a sleepwalker. They told me that if I noticed him walking around not to be alarmed, if it happened, I was simply to guide Brandon back into bed. Brandon had been asleep for an hour without a peep. I was watching a rerun of Three's Company on TV when I heard heavy breathing behind me. I spun around and let out a short yelp of fright when I saw Brandon. He was standing in his light blue pajamas staring at me. Brandon? Are you awake? He didn't respond. I'm going to put you back into bed now. I took him by the arm, led him to his bedroom, and tucked him back into his bed. That was really creepy. I went back to watching TV. It was about 30 minutes later when I heard a loud creak coming from upstairs. Brandon, is that you? I didn't get a response, so I slowly ascended the stairway to the second floor. Even though I fully expected to see Brandon up there wandering around, I still startled when I saw him. It was an eerie sight. He was sitting in the middle of the hallway, gently rocking back and forth while sucking his thumb. He was staring ahead, blankly. Brandon? No response. I did as I had before and took him by the forearm. He followed my lead, stood up, and allowed me to guide him back to his bedroom. Once again, I got him into the bed. He was lying on his back and closed his eyes, so I pulled the covers up just underneath his chin. All at once, his hand jetted out from underneath the covers and grabbed my wrist. I let out a scream and his eyes flung open. He stared at me coldly and spoke in a manly voice. You're going to die in here. Immediately after saying that, he let go of my wrist and closed his eyes. I ran downstairs and waited on the front porch until the Sawyers returned home. Needless to say, I never babysat for them again. Jack Frost My name is David Doolin. I'm a retired homicide detective from Chicago. I've seen a lot of blood and guts in my day, and if I told you the amount of demented psychopaths wandering around on the streets at night, you wouldn't be able to sleep. But none of them compare to the most maniacal, sadistic, cold, evil bastard I ever encountered. Jack Frost. His real name was Jack Winters. The media parrots had a field day with his name. Notice I didn't call them media hounds. Yeah, the media nowadays doesn't have an ounce of hound dog in them. 
They don't track down anything. They just repeat words that others say. Thus, my nickname for them, Media Parrots. Anyhow, one of the parrots came up with the moniker Jack Frost, and it stuck. As brain-dead as these media dregs are, I figured they wouldn't be able to get past the killer's first name and was sure they'd just dig up the cliched nickname of Jack the Ripper. As unimaginative as that would have been, it actually would have been fitting due to the nature of this maniac's handiwork. Not unlike Jack the Ripper, Jack Frost targeted prostitutes. And over the span of a couple years, I lost track of the amount of prostitutes we found dead. It wasn't uncommon for hookers to show up cold and stiff. They waded through the dregs of society on a regular basis and had bad habits. Most were drug-related. As far as murders go, it was easy to write off most as deals with John's gone bad. Or a pimp making a point. But when Jack Frost left his mark, there was no mistaking it. He mutilated them. We'd find the whores in rooms. Sometimes they would be sprawled out on the bed, dissected. Their body parts would be laid neatly next to the corpse. Or sometimes they'd be strewn about the room. I guess it depended on what mood Jack Frost was in when he butchered them. Other times, we'd find the room decorated with the prostitutes' intestines. He'd string them up around the room from wall to wall, not unlike party streamers. This was one sick twist, let me tell ya. It's widely speculated that he murdered at least three dozen people during his reign of terror. Probably a lot more. It was just dumb luck that we caught him. I was assisting the Vice Squad on a completely unrelated prostitute sting operation. See, some prostitutes had a pretty nice operation going. They would lure a John back to a motel room. Once inside the room, the John would be met by two men. Those men would proceed to knock out the John and rob him. We had a pretty good idea as to who was doing this operation. We just needed to catch them in the act. So we had our men stake out the motel room that we suspected these crimes were taking place in. Well, it turns out the person they brought back to the room was Jack Frost. When we heard the disturbance from the room and kicked the door in, we expected to find the two muggers busting up the John. What we found instead was horrifying. Jack Frost had killed both of the men and the prostitute. He was in the process of dissecting the prostitute on the bed when we busted the door down. It's one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen, and believe me, I've seen a lot. The creepiest part of it all was later that night. He was being held in a private jail cell. I let the guards on duty take a break, and I stood near that cell and watched him. The only thing that kept him from launching himself at me and ripping my throat out was the thick iron bars between us. I expected him to be acting like a caged animal, perhaps pacing back and forth, frothing at the mouth, and darting his eyes around like a madman. But what I experienced was the exact opposite. He sat in his cell on the bed. He was leaning back against the wall. He had his hands behind his head and his eyes were closed. He looked so relaxed, too relaxed. I mean, he was busted. He had to know he would never see the light of day again. How could he appear to be so peaceful? Then he opened his eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eyes. They didn't look human. They looked evil. Pure evil. He grinned. The son of a bitch grinned at me as though he knew something I didn't. It was at this time that he did something that haunts my nightmares to this day. He whistled. He slowly, creepily whistled the tune Jimmy Crack Corn as he closed his diabolical eyes and laid his head back comfortably. That was the only time I ever saw him face to face, thank God. He was declared to be insane and was shipped off to the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital in Kentucky. He bided his time for years waiting for an opening, waiting for someone to screw up. 
waiting for his chance. I found out this morning that he escaped, leaving the bodies of two patients, two guards, and a doctor in his wake. He hasn't left much of a trace. That's not a surprise because he's smart. Real smart. Catching him won't be easy. Until then, he's out there. A true maniac on the loose.